You are listening to The Magic of Endings, authored by Tom Avery and narrated to you by Audiobooks with Keeper of Lost Stories. Please subscribe for more such audiobooks. Thank you. The Girl with Red Hair Wait, called Aunt Pen, not after Rico. She wasn't worried about him running whooping dancing with trevor around his ankles she called after granddad she called after she chased after him hobbling along dragging jojo with her mr Locke," she said catching up jojo at her side without an answer to his question you need to understand some things it had been a time since jojo had been on that beach but the sand beneath his feet, Jojo remembered that sensation somehow. The way it shifted, the way it moved. Listen to me, Mr. Locke. Granda didn't slow. He kept on walking, not running, but walking with purpose toward the two figures who were still making their way down the beach toward the sea, pulling the red boat, which now they were closer. Jojo could see was bigger than he had first imagined and was held on a two-wheel trailer contraption. They weren't the only ones heading for the pair. A girl whose curled red hair flew out behind her ran to catch them. Stop right there, Joseph S. Locke. Stop right there, Aunt Ben said, forcefully now. Forcefully enough that Grandad did was a stone's throw from where the man and boy and the boat would pass. Grandad did not look back but looked down. He waited a moment for Aunt Ben and Jojo to catch up. I have not seen my son for a long time, he said. I intend to see him today. You can see him, said Aunt Ben. But please stop and listen to me for a moment. Grandad did not turn, but he did not start walking either. Not yet. We are in the past here. We are a very long way from home. This is your past. Now think back. Think about this day. Do you remember having a chat with an older version of you 30 years ago? Do you remember a fairy in the shape of an aging human? Do you remember meeting your grandsons? Did any of that happen? Grandad stood statue still. Jojo thought he understood what Aunt Ben was getting at. None of that happened. So, now we are here. You can't do anything that didn't happen. You can't. What if we do, said Jojo. Well, Aunt Ben said, you just can't. The world would reject us. We would be spat back into our time, as fast as you can say Merlin's beard. But I don't remember an old man standing here watching us or a boy chasing a dog, said Grandad quietly. None of us were here. This did not happen. But it did, said Aunt Pen. It had to have. You can't change time. Small things, like who was standing on a beach on a certain day. It's happening right now as we walk and talk and breathe. It's happening. And it already happened. But if you change big things, like talking to a past version of yourself, well, that's a big old time-traveling monster of a headache kind of complicated. The world would not be happy. Neither Grandad nor Jojo replied for a moment. What was there to say to that? But then Grandad, still quiet, still not looking back, said, So I don't remember us being here and... No, you don't. And we are going to keep it that way. We are just some ordinary people on the beach, okay? Ordinary people on the beach, said Grandad. So I can't... No, said Aunt Ben. And I can't. I'm sorry, said the fairy grandmother. But what if I... Then we'd be gone, back to the present day, back to where we belong. Where we belong, said Grandad, setting out again, but not along the beach as he had been. Not towards the figure, the man, the boy, and the red-haired girl, whose voices now drifted across the flat sand. Will we catch anything, said the voice of a boy, a voice which sounded like a that of Rico's. You'll never find it, you know, said the red-haired girl, as if she was having an entirely different conversation. Grandad walked toward the sea, keeping his distance, but keeping pace with the man, who Jojo could see was Grandad. It was him. Not looked a bit like him, it was him, just smoother, less grey, but the same golden brown skin, the same broad shoulders and straight back. A uh, Slimmer granddad, a younger granddad, 
The wind caught his words and washed away his reply to the boy, who walked on the other side, out of sight of Jojo. Younger granddad and the boy dad did not seem to notice that, following they were there all along, but the girl had turned to look. From where she trailed behind, one hand resting on the very back of the boat, she glanced at them, frowned, then turned away, her eyes back on Jojo's dad. They caught the boy's reply. And how will we know where to fish? Jojo wondered if his granddad, the man who walked just ahead of him, the old man who he didn't really know, who wandered along lonely rivers, missed all this. None of them came to the beach anymore, not since. Did granddad miss the sea and the sand and pulling a boat down the beach? Could the old man in front of him still put a boat down a beach? It looked heavy, that boat, that boat. Jojo had seen that boat before, back in the barn, dusty and faded, but the same boat. We'll know, said the younger granddad. Their paths were closing in. They were closer now. Soon they would pass Rico where he was fighting Trevor for a thick whitish plank of wood. The sea's in our blood, you know. We're sailors, us locks. Always have been. Right the way back to Josiah Lock. He was a pirate, you know. We have been seafarers since he sailed out of St. Kitts 300 years ago. Those words hit Jojo in the gut. He had heard them before, almost word for word. He had heard his granddad say them on this same beach, with this same boat. He was sitting in the boat that time though. He was sitting as his father bolted down the beach. He remembered when he learned to sail. When he learned to sail, the younger granddad sounded proud. Proud of who he was, of where they had come from. Will I be a sailor? said the boy on the other side of the younger granddad. I'm gonna be a sailor, said Jojo in his memory. You can be whatever you want to be, said the younger granddad. You can be whatever you want to be, said his dad in that memory that wound itself round this one. Then the girl with red hair spoke, bringing him crashing back to the present, or the past, or wherever it was. You wouldn't mind if I give you a thousand years, she said. No one can find it. Don't you want to play? Jojo stopped in his tracks. Tears were welling up from the empty place that was filling again, filling with memory. Come on, said Aunt Ben. No time for that. Jojo gulped and walked on. No time for that. He needed time, though. Time to think. Why were all these memories coming to him now? What did they have to do with the appearance of Aunt Ben? And who, who was this girl with red hair? She had, he had seen those eyes, that hair before too. Jojo pushed down the thoughts. They would have to wait. They followed the younger granddad and the boy who was Jojo and Rico's dad down to the sea. They stood and watched as man and son unloaded the boat from the trailer. They watched as a pair slid the boat across the wet sand and into the wash. They watched in silence out of the corners of their eyes, pretending instead to be looking out to sea. All the while, memory came flooding into Jojo's mind like the crashing waves. He'd done this more than once. He had done this many times, been out to sea, in a boat with his father and granddad. He just knew it. He could see it. He could see them laughing and smiling. He could see his dad, a dark silhouette against the moon. He remembered sitting in that same boat, his father's arms around him, with the stars above, he remembered. Back on the beach in the past, the girl stood and watched too, her hands in the pockets of her floral dress, her feet making shapes in the wet sand. Rico and Trevor joined them. Woohoo! This is brilliant, said Rico, breaking their silent stare. And it's all in the bathroom? What we looking at? That boy, said Jojo. It's... He's our dad. The boy in question had his back to the watchers. He had not been much help to Grandad, the younger version, as the boat was rolled and dragged. And now he too watched as Grandad fitted a mast and sails to the red vessel. What? gasped Rico. Ah, what? The little girl turned at the noise and frowned at the group of Jojo, Rico, Grandad, Aunt Ben and Trevor. But the younger Grandad and boy dad were engrossed in the boat shh they can't see us you mean like we are invisible they mustn't see us aunt ben hissed still leaning on jojo's arms 
If they do, we will be ejected out of the world and back to ours. It won't be much of a fun trip, I assure you. Rico huffed and said, So, is this like, he looked around, the past? Like we time traveled, like a film or something? Jojo nodded. Aunt Pen said, Well, it's a complicated matter. Listen. But before she could explain, a shrill voice broke the air, an angry voice. A voice that seemed bigger than the tiny girl who made it. What about our game? She shouted above the waves. They were in the boat now, younger granddad and the boy dad. I'm going fishing, Mabel. Keep your game. Who's the girl? Granddad, said Rico. But granddad did not answer. Granddad, granddad, are you okay? Granddad looked away for a moment from his former self and his son. When he looked back at Rico, his cheeks were damp and water filled his eyes. I've not seen him in so long, but this feels like it was yesterday. I remember it all. I remember his big hands like yours, Jojo. I remember how excited he was about everything, just like you, Rico. I remember. I remember how it felt to hold him. I can still smell his hair, he said. I didn't think I'd ever remember again. Jojo knew exactly what he meant. He remembered too, big hands, how it felt to hold him. The smell of his hair, he remembered it all. Jojo stepped towards his granddad, leaving Aunt Ben to totter on the shore, and pulled him into a hug. Granddad, he said. Rico joined them. So did Trevor. Sitting himself on granddad's feet over the breeze and waves, they heard the unmistakable sound of the little dog farting. Locks at sea. They hugged a while and when they turned back to the sea and to dad and the younger granddad, the red boat was 50 meters out amongst the waves. He showed me the world, your dad. When I was with him, it was like seeing through a pair of new eyes, granddad sniffed. I'm glad I'm here with you too, remembering. There were just two figures in the boat. The girl with the flaming hair had gone. Not on the beach at all. Gone. Well, said Grandad, taking a long sniff of sea air. As we are here on a beautiful day like today, we should see what can be done about you city boys getting a taste of the sea. On all their trips down to Dor, Grandad had never spoken like this. They had not come near the beach, no sand, no sea. And now, a taste of the sea? Jojo did not like to tell him that he already had in his mind. He remembered it all. He remembered the sea and the waves and the feeling of the deep breath beneath the boat. Grandad must not remember this part, as Jojo had not remembered it till now. Hmm, we don't have a boat of our own, but, said Grandad. Ah, said Aunt Pen. That's not actually true, she said to searching her necklaces and chains. You've got a boat, shouted Rico. Brilliant, let's do it. How could you? began Grandad, but before he could finish, Ah, here it is, Aunt Pen held up a pendant that looked like a fat fish. It even glimmered as one, the sunlight glinting off its green, blue, and purple scales. Now, there's an act to opening this. If I just, she ran a finger along the fish's shimmering side, it should, and with that, the mouth of the fish sprang open and out flew a yellow pellet. Like a medicine tablet, it flew. Aunt Pen did not reach for it. She knew better than that. But Rico did. He flung out a hand, grasping at the spinning yellow tube. For now it was a tube, as big as one of Mum's lipsticks. Rico did not catch it, but knocked it on, out of reach. Next, Jojo made a grab for it. As it grew and twisted, it was the size of a school dictionary, bright yellow and seemingly made from little planks of wood. Like his brother, Jojo did not get a hand on it, just a fingertip. For a moment, it seemed to balance there, on the end of Jojo's finger. He made to flick it backwards, but instead flicked it on. Which was probably a good thing, all told, as though it grew and grew. It was a box, it was a cushion, it was bigger and bigger. And whatever reflexes Grandad and the Navy boxer had but once, they returned to him then. He stuck out his hand and grabbed hold of a rope, which flailed free of the bulging, billowing yellow thing, or maybe it had hold of him. Grandad's feet left the sand and he joined the huge yellow shape, now as big as an armchair, as it sailed through the air towards the waiting waves. 
Jojo would later say it was hard to tell where Grandad stopped, and the yellow thing began. They were a whirling mass of yellow wood and flailing ropes, swaths of white canvas, and the occasional sighting of Grandad's shock of silver hair and brown skin. Then, as quickly as it had begun, it came to a halt. There, in front of them, bobbing on the sea just a few paces away, was a yellow sailing boat larger than the one that they had set out. A sailing boat as clean and shipshape as any boat you can imagine. The Scat Millen, said Aunt Pen. She's a beauty, isn't she? Family boat. She is. Built by one of my sisters, Polpara the Young, Polpara the Explorer. Grandad called Jojo and Rico, only half listening to Aunt Pen, but still struck by the idea that this fairy had a family. Oh, yes, good point, she said. Where is your grandfather? Should have probably warned you as to what would happen. Mr. Locke? From the boat came a groan, and before they could stop him, Trevor was out amongst the waves, yapping and splashing at the yellow boat, the Scatmelon, and at the groggy looking grandad who pulled himself up and looked over the side at him. He gurgled as he held his dizzy head in his hands. Just ordinary people on the beach, you said. After they had laughed, after they had splashed through the knee-high water and pushed the boat out deeper, after they had leaped in to join the recovering granddad and well-settled Aunt Pen, who had explained that certain magical objects were designed to keep themselves hidden from unsuspecting eyes, like this miraculous boat and even incredibly the doorway on the cliff sides. But that took a might more magic than I had thought it would. After all that, the lock went out to sea. If you have not been in a large vessel or a little one amongst the endless waves on top of the vast, vast sea, it's hard to explain how it feels. You feel small for a start. You know you are powerless against the great muscles of the ocean current. You feel free as well. For in every direction there is possibility. There are the open waves and the horizon and beyond that, well, who knows what. And that is precisely the point. It's a bit small, isn't it? Jojo said, clinging on to the very narrow, very low bench that lined the sides of the boat. Well, it's not built for the likes of you. Is it your... I think it is your great hulking giant, said Aunt Pen. A bit rocky, Rico muttered. He was beginning to turn a shade of green. You'll feel all right soon enough, said Grandad. You heard the man, me, I mean us, logs, our sailors, through and through, got salt in our blood. And Grandad was right. After a few minutes of pitching waves, both Rico's stomach and the side settled down. Soon Rico and Trevor were scrambling from side to side. That is brilliant, Barb. This is just amazing, Barb. We are at home, having breakfast, and then we are here, in the sea, in a boat. Brilliant. Jojo, however, was lost in thought, lost in the past. Not this past, but his own. He was, it seemed, getting to know his father, and there on the boat, he remembered more. He remembered the red boat. He remembered his father standing and hammering and fixing it with Grandad one summer, while Jojo sat on the bench inside and ate ice cream. He remembered sailing to a secret cove and dad diving for scallops. He remembered learning to fish. His dad was behind him, his arms around him. Look, buddy, you just flick it. His dad's hands were over his as he held his rod. Together they flicked the line, the weight and hook out to sea. That's it, bud, that's it. A kiss landed on top of Juju's head. He remembered. When Aunt Ben produce impossible fishing rods from another necklace and Grandad proceeded to hand them out. Jojo clung to his, resting his head against the cool metal pole. Fishing, said Grandad, is the art of patience. You cast and you wait. You wait and you watch. You and you feel. You feel the fish beneath us. Feel them take a nibble at the bait. Feel them have a sniff. Feel and wait. Wait till they have got hold. Some way away a red dot was set on the calm sea and Jojo could imagine a much younger granddad giving much the same speech to another boy, a boy who was his dad. Then comes the skill, the skill of the real. Reel him in, reel him in. 
While he talked, Grandad was showing Rico and Jojo around their rods. Rico was all in, but Jojo just nodded, knowing that somewhere in his head he knew all of this already. It was Aunt Pen who had manned the boat, sailing them out to sea. She was still the woman Aunt Pen, but there was more and more of the fairy about her. Somehow she had changed into the red jacket, striped trousers and leather boots that she wore as a fairy. Her gold hoops and bandolier of chains swung and glimmered as she quickly took down the sails, rolling them up and catching them and tying them in elaborate arrays of knots. Here looks like a good spot, she called over the winds and the waves. They were some way out. The beach was a stripe of dusty yellow. The rocks were grey stones, small enough you could reach out and grab them. The ark, which Jojo could not help but lift his eyes to look at ever so often, was a fairy-sized door sitting atop the sea. There was something about the arcway. Jojo couldn't shake the feeling it was watching them. Grandad showed Rico how to cast his line out on the other side of the boat from Jojo. And Rico was soon watching and waiting. Aunt Pen was lying back with her eyes closed, letting the sun beat down. Trevor had traveled and settled himself next to the fairy, his head resting on her leg. Jojo still clung to the fishing rod. You okay, boy? called Grandad, attaching a little worm on the hook on his own line. Where had the worms come from? Another of Aunt Pen's necklaces? What else did she have in there? Hmm, Jojo nodded. All right, lad. Grandad turned back to his own rod and left Jojo to a gentle lapping of the waves. The up and down and up and down left him to his memories. Knock. Was that? The knocking of the waves against the bottom of the boat? Knock, knock. No one else seemed to have noticed it. Rico and Grandad stayed on the other side, staring into the water. Aunt Pen had fallen asleep. Knock, knock, knock. It was definitely coming from below, from Jojo's side of the boat. What would be knocking on a boat from the sea below? Jojo did not like to think. Jojo leaned towards the edge of the boat. His stomach churned. His jaws tightened. His He leaned further. He peered down into the sea. At first there was nothing. There was reflected blue light of the sky and reflected yellow wood. There was a dark shadow beneath the boat. Jojo was going to lean back to think on these memories and what it all meant. But before he could, his eyes widened. There was something there. Eyes staring back. Two pairs of eyes. Huge eyes that grew larger as he stared. No, not larger. They grew closer. And Jojo could see more than just eyes and nose on each of the two creatures. The small button nose of a child and a mouth, wide, stretching open, lined with sharp teeth. The last thing he saw was a series of pronged fins on top of the sea creatures' heads. A long fan of fin in green and purple and blue. This was the last thing Jojo saw because along with the strange faces rose arms and hands. Hands with long webbed fingers which reached and grabbed and took hold of Jojo with an iron grip. Now he did call out, Grandad! Aunt P! He did not finish screaming Aunt Pen's name for the creatures, small but far stronger than Jojo, pulled him from the boat, like you'd pull a fish from the sea, and with a splash he was gone. Trevor jumped up at the noise, barking and farting. Grandad dropped his pole and leaped, throwing out a hand to grab his grandson, Rico did not know what to do. Something pulled at his fishing rod at the very moment. He held it in one hand and reached back with the other. Jojo! he shouted. Aunt Pen merely opened one eye, craned her neck to look. Marvin, she muttered with a shake of her head. Beneath the waves. It was indeed a pair of mermen that had hold of Jojo. He struggled against their grip. He struggled and pulled. He wrenched at them. He twisted and tried to spin. He threw himself back and forth and back and forth. Any minute, he thought, he would be out of breath. Any moment, he would simply drown. And these things, these creatures, these children, they would have him. For children is exactly what they look like to Jojo. Children smaller than Rico. Five-year-olds, like the children in the reception class at school. Tiny fish-like children, tiny but strong. They pulled him down and down as he struggled and struggled. Knowing at any moment his breath would fail, he was dead. This was the end. 
except it wasn't his breath was not running out the surprise when he realized that this was so great that he forgot to gather about struggling he looked at the mere boys one looked back at him and smiled was that to the stretch grimace a smile that was definitely a wink very strange the sea creature had a bracelet on his wrist not some special twisted seaweed thing a plastic band green with algae but unmistakably the sort of band put on you when you find yourself in hospital but if one of these things had ever been in hospital surely the whole world would know about it wouldn't they unless unless this thing was once a boy like him is that what they planned to make him a fish thing the mare boy to jojo's other side did not look at him but peered onward into the darkness of the sea and here came jojo's next great surprise if he could look at the creatures and he could look ahead into the gloom then he could see he could open his eyes in the salty water and he didn't feel a thing his eyes didn't sting at all then he felt it something had changed in his neck on his eyes his hands too he looked first to his hands where they were pulled forward by fish children his hands green in the fading light from the above had grown webs like the creatures he couldn't see his neck but looking side long at the mare boys he could guess what had happened there on their necks on his was a series of slit like openings he knew what these were because of a particularly good school project on animal adaptation they were gills allowing him to breathe under water he couldn't guess what had happened to his eyes but something had happened something to protect them from the sea he screamed it came out as a silent parade of bubbles was he already changed was he a mer too would he be a sea creature forever there was no way to ask but he did have some hope he was not scared like the creatures yet as far as he could feel there was no fins on his head he pressed his tongue against his teeth no sharp little fish teeth more magic temporary like aunt pen's magic he hoped hoped and he took the hope with him into the heart of the sea they did not seem now to be traveling all together downward they shoot on somewhere away from the boat the fish children's long webbed feet beat at the water propelling them as a trio of troubadours looking up and back jojo could see the sun it was the pin point of light but there was no sign of the boat no sign of grandad and rico and aunt pen aunt pen would she come for him or was this her doing he still wasn't sure if he could trust her he could see the sea bed now ripples of dark sand gardens of waving seaweed and fish shoals of some little silver darting fish onward they went sand gave way to rocks fish gave way to carbs bigger than jojo would have guessed these crabs sometimes else something else was big down there too it moved out from behind a rock as they passed a shark not huge like the films but still a shark jojo tried to shout again to scream the mare boys paid him no mind as they dragged him onward they were definitely not going down now as the sea bed sloped upward so did they more rock and weed fish and crabs no creature paid them any mind the shark had not followed ahead now jojo could see an end ahead was a wall of rock then a gap then another wall of rock they were not making for the gap they were making for the wall and they were not slowing jojo pulled again pulled and tried to shout to the fish children how could they not see it solid dark rock face were they like birds flying into a clear window closer and closer they drew and the rock grew darker till it was a wall of black Jojo pulled and pulled but there was nothing he could do to get away from the mare their grip was iron Jojo screamed once more once more was all he had time for before they hit the black but they did not hit a wall unseen to Jojo they had flown straight into the mouth of an underwater cave a cave or tunnel for as Jojo's eyes adjusted he could see the smooth walls as they passed deeper into the dark walls which began to glow still they shot onward these mare boys were on a mischievous mission they passed unseen through the dark tunnel and then again without warning out into a large chamber and out of the water into the air and they're finally bobbing on the surface the two mare boys released jojo's arms
he sunk a moment before kicking his own feet kicking and swimming to step in front of him when he reached them he lay and drew in a breath he rubbed his now so rest and looked around the chamber was not any old cave this was in fact no cave at all it was a room of sorts it was circular with large pillars holding up the ceiling above which glittered with light of thousands upon thousands of glow worms between each pillar there was an archway arc doorway nine jojo counted but these went nowhere unlike the smooth carved stone of the pillars and arch the openings ended in rough raw rock there was no way out of the cave where on earth am i now he said this to no one in particular but as if in answer one of the two mere boys leaped from the water over jojo to the top of the steps here he pointed forward jojo stood and clambered up the steps they were slick with green weed and jojo nearly slipped more than once he joined the tiny fish child at the top of the steps and took another look around he had seen a room like this before this one was smaller but they very much was like the room he had seen the fairy aunt pen was in the room that traveled to by light the room with the statues of a boy playing a man standing in thought the room with the two silver chairs although in this room there were no stained glass windows and there were no silver chairs instead of the chairs was a wooden chest the sort a pirate would keep his treasure in this chest is what the fish child pointed to he pointed and made to speak but as with jojo under the water no sound came out no words but jojo did not need them he could see what he had been brought here for so he said should i open it the fish boy nodded he reached out a hand to push jojo forward as the long webbed hand came towards him jojo saw his own hands were no longer webbed he felt his neck as the mer boy nudged him no gills and as he noticed this drips of sea water fell into his eyes stinging and blinding for a brief moment phew he was not a merman then just a boy in a cave with no way out no way out but a way on words he looked once more at the mer child the creature nodded pushed jojo forward then leaped away like a frog back to where his partner waited bobbing in the pool of water what was there to do jojo walked on leaving pools of water with every step as the sea drained from his clothes he looked around at the empty arcs and the shadows of the huge pillars shadows grew and shrank and grew again as the glow worms moved and shifted above he felt like he could be scared but he was not he felt like that he was a braver boy than jojo lock who had started the summer holiday it was a short walk to the chest it should have been an odd thing jojo thought old and rusted but it was not the wood itself was shiny with varnish and metal straps almost sparkled under the insect's light jojo could not imagine who had put it here but it was clear it had not been here long jojo did not hesitate he lifted the lid as you or i would jojo expected this chest in the hidden room to be filled to the brim with treasure he expected glittering gems jewelry and piles of pirated plunder but in this chest there was just one thing now this thing was old it was a coin one singular nine sided red gold coin jojo took it between finger and thumb on one side was stamped a series of small symbols or maybe letters jojo spun it between his fingers the other side depicted the head of a woman a woman with curls of hair which caught the light and flickered red but not just any woman she had without question the pointed ears of a fairy and a face that was instantly recognizable to jojo and as if in thinking of her aunt pen chose that moment to appear the piece of map what have you got there jojo lock aunt pen had swum in she had not been brought by scaly mer boys her voice came from high above and as jojo looked up to spy her sitting on some stone shelf near the top of the tall pillars amongst the many glow worms he held up the old coin what was it doing here who'd built this strange place he had no answers but somehow he knew this coin was important he would need it that's why he had been brought here 
a coin, he said, with your face on it. What did it mean that this coin had Ben Perro's face on it? Not my face, she said, still seated high up in the ceiling above. And then in the next instant, with just a streak of light, she stood beside him, inspecting the coin. My sisters, another moment, another streak, and she was beside the steps leading down to the pool, which Jojo had entered from. My sister, the one who... Aunt Pen opened her mouth and closed it. Opened and closed. More lost words. Jojo frowned at her, then down at the red coin. Keep it safe. It is vital. It is deathly important, she said. Jojo looked down at the chest. This chest for this coin must be important. He pocketed the coin deep into his shorts. What now? said Jojo. Now, said Aunt Pen, you act. What? Courage is not enough. You must have the will to act. And act quickly. Are you ready? Ready? Ready to run. And as she shouted this last word, somewhere in the rock below a drum sounded, a third that shook the floor and sent a ripple through that water where the mare boys had been watching. They were gone now. Jojo rubbed fresh drips of water from his eyes. He blinked and looked to Aunt Pen for answers. What was happening? What was this drumming that was sounding again? But as he looked, she was a streak, a streak of light, and she was gone. Aunt Pen? Jojo shouted as the drum beat again and the ground shook, shook this time as if the giant's hands rocked the place. Jojo stumbled. How do I get out? Jojo called, looking up at the ceiling where he saw what seemed to be, but couldn't be, stars going out. Glowworms were one by one disappearing, crawling away or simply stopping their glow. The earth drummed and the ground shook. Then there was a crack, like the bone of something huge breaking. This came from close by, from one of the rocky openings. Jojo watched in horror as one of the craggy blank rock faces came to life. The rock shivered and rippled like the surface of the pool. It bulged outwards, taking shape. It was as if some creature pushed its way out of the earth and into the world. Not any creature, a man, a huge man. From an entrance to Jojo's right came a great rock giant. Aunt Ben! Jojo screamed again. No reply except the earth pounding. No reply except another terrible crack and another and another as each rock one by one came to life, rippling as another stone man pushed his way into the world. No reply except a grinding, crushing voice which came from the first stone man. Who disturbs a piece of Mab? Jojo's mind raised. Mab? Stone giants? A coin with a fairy's face? Abandoned by Aunt Pen? I'm ready. Ready for what? How will I get out? How will I get out? How will I get out? All of this flew through his mind as the stone men took their first step into the world. How would he get out? Only one way. He ran to the pool as the darkness swelled. The frothing water caught light of the fast few glowworms as they vanished, caught the great shadows of the stone men as they lunged forward. Jojo plunged in, the darkness complete, the water now cold as ice. Who disturbs a piece of map? came the voice again. Jojo's body flinched away from the freezing water. His brain said, you can't swim in this, but his heart carried him in and on. And before he had time to decide, he was in the water and swimming. The water swirled and churned and threw him forward as a stone first followed him in. But he was gone back into the tunnel, pursued by the voice of the stone man, which dwindled to a bathroom. Who disturbs the peace? There were no mere boys now. No hands pulling him on and no webbed hands and gills. Just his soft plushy hands stretching against the rock walls as he swam and fought and pushed onwards. You won't make this, his brain repeated again and again. Your asthma. But what choice did he have? He swam on. He clawed at the falls and the water. He, his lungs grew tighter and tighter. There were no breaths to be had. What was that ahead? Was this light he saw? He had read somewhere that when you died, you saw a light ahead. The light at the end of the tunnel. Was this it? Was this the end? 
He swam on towards the light, his last strength, his last few strokes, and then when he thought it was all he had, he found a scrap more, a little seed of fight still in his bones, a seed which grew and grew and burst out of him, pushing him through the final stretch into the light, out of the tunnel, into the sea and then up, up to the surface. His first breath was like that gulp of cool water on the hottest day. He lay, he floated, he gasped in all he could, while the sea washed around him. He opened his eyes and he knew exactly where he was. There above him, a little to the left, was a huge arc. The waves crashed against it. Safe, he thought. He could float. He could swim. He would get back to the beach, then he would have some words with Aunt Ben. How could she leave him? Safe, he thought. But then, above a crack, again, a great crack which seemed to echo off the waves. The ark itself was coming down. With another crack, a whole chunk of it splintered and shivered and began to loosen itself from the hole. Then another sound turned Jojo, a voice floating across the sea. He crested a wave and saw the red of the boat as he heard the younger granddad's voice. The door, he shouted. It's coming down. The ark fell. Great chunks came crashing towards Jojo. He flung up his arms as if he could hold up the rock, but instead of being crushed, he found himself lifted. He was sucked out of the water towards the beach as a huge jack boulder fell right where he had been. He spun and turned as if he were caught in some invisible whirlwind. Jojo! came a shout. And there was Rico, and there was Grandad, and Trevor, and Aunt Ben, all waving from a yellow boat which twisted and floated up into the air as if it too was in tornado which pulled Jojo back towards the beach. Closer and closer, they came together as they webbed towards the rocks, and now the wind did howl around them. What's happening now? screamed Jojo. He'd had more than enough of this wish, of the past, of this little slice of magic. We are being ejected, called Aunt Pen. We changed something. The wind was a sore now. The ark, shouted Grandad. The door! He looked back over the edge of the boat, which still spiraled through the air turning around and round Jojo. Then Grandad let out a cry, a cry of pain, throwing his head into his hands. Arrgh! Grandad, said Jojo. At the same moment, Trevor began to bark and Rico called, That's the toilet door. Sure enough, hurtling towards them was their very own bathroom door. It wasn't fixed to the rocks on the beach. It was too caught up in its own tornado. There was no time for any more talk as the chunk of wood plunged towards them. Only time for Jojo to grab hold of the boat. Only time to scream, which both boys did at the top of their lungs. Trevor barked, excitement not fear coming from the little dog, that the boat and the door collided with a splinter of wood and a final scream. Out of the storm. The wind had stopped. The screaming ended. Jojo could not hear the sea any longer. In fact, all that he could hear was a familiar jingle of Mickey Max family game show. Then Trevor started barking and his paws pattered away. Jojo opened his eyes. He kneeled, panting, on the floor of their hallway. Beside him, Rico was clapping and laughing. Grandad leaned against the wall, wheezing, and Aunt Ben crouched to pick up a large strip of yellow wood from the, amongst the chips that covered the floor. The bathroom door stood open, but beyond it was just there, very ordinary pale cream bathroom. No sea, no waves, no rocks, absolutely no bar boys. If Jojo had caught his breath, he would have been shouting at Aunt Ben. How could she leave him? But his breath did not come. He tried to stand, but his legs were like jelly. Instead, he fumbled in his pocket for the waterlogged asthma pump. That was amazing, shouted Rico as Grandma appeared in the doorway. To the living room. Now, she said, I may be not certain of much these days, but I do know that something is not quite right here. Erm, um, said Rico. Well, said Aunt Pen. But Grandad said, Come on, my dearest, I'll explain. Grandad did his best to explain about the fairy and the wish and the day on the beach to Grandma, sitting on the sofa, once they had all recovered and changed out of their wet and salty clothes. And even though she did not usually know Tuesday from Sunday, lost her glasses a dozen 
times a day and often put the dirty dishes in the fridge instead of the sink. She seemed after some time to have grasped Grandad's meaning. So you are a fairy, she said to Aunt Pen, who nodded and smiled, holding Grandma's hand tenderly, dark skin cupped around white. Well, that does explain that little fellow in the kitchen. He must be some sort of goblin type of thing, correct? Hob, good fellow, having already cleared up the mess of wood in the hallway, was at that moment busy in the kitchen, singing and trying to fix the washing machine. Jojo stole guilty glances in his direction, still not sure if the broken appliance was down to his holy rock or not. Unsurprisingly, for so wise a lady, said Aunt Pen, you are quite right. Fairies and goblins that like used to be quite common around here, didn't they, Joey? Grandad nodded at this. That's what they say. Remember that little girl? Grandma went on. What was her name? Red hair? Little Mabel, said Grandad. Was it Mabel? They said she was more than half fairy, remember? Grandad nodded again. They did. Strange little thing she was. Jojo remembered the girl on the beach, remembered the red hair. Well, said Grandma, I think it's past time at a wish then. No, please, Grandma, said Jojo. Just as Rico said, yeah, let's do it. I think, I think, called Jojo over his brother. I think she's going to get us really hurt. Aunt Ben looked shocked as all eyes turned to her. But as Rico and his grandparents turned back to Jojo, he was sure Aunt Ben grinned and winked. Just a moment, just a small one. We nearly fell to our deaths, he said. Well, said Aunt Ben, we were almost crushed in a tunnel. I got you out of there. I was kidnapped by sea creatures. You sort of did that yourself. Staring at mermen is never a good idea. Then you abandoned me in that cave. You knew the way out, and here we are, all safe and sound. Everyone looked now from Jojo to Aunt Ben. The fairy did not speak. She waited for Jojo. Everyone waited for him. Still he hesitated. Jojo took another long puff of his asthma pump. But, he said, I'm remembering, and... He trailed off then. He didn't know how to explain the bigger plan at work, the game he thought Aunt Ben was playing. He just could not say what he believed this adventure led to. Now, he tasted hope. He could not dash it all by speaking its name. What? said Grandad. Remembering what? I'm remembering him. I'm, I'm remembering Dad. Grandad gulped. Rico frowned up at his brother. Trevor fought it. That sounds wonderful, Grandma whispered. To remember my boy, that would be the greatest wish come true. He's gone, you see. I've not seen him for such a long time. Gone. Jojo knew what she meant. He wasn't just gone, gone. He wasn't just missing in person. Somehow he was missing in their minds, in their hearts. He was a big empty space. But to remember, it was the greatest gift. That's what he had tasted. That's what I'd wish, said Grandma, who in all this madness was talking more sense than she had done in years. I'd wish to live out just one memory again. I think I'd want to do it again, just one special day. Grandad squeezed his wife's hand. Rico was sat cross-legged on the carpet. That sounds brilliant, he whispered. Even Trevor understood this was an important moment. His fart came out as quite... Aunt Pen looked at Jojo. She raised her eyebrows. It was up to him. His choice to continue this journey or not. His choice to plunge them back into the unknown. The will to act, he thought to himself. I must choose. Eventually, I must choose. Without a word, Jojo nodded. Done, exclaimed Aunt Pen. She wicked her nose and blinked. The light was a pulse, a brilliant pulse which seemed to come from all of them and burst out across the room. And then, nothing. Ooh, said Grandma. What? Was that it? Aunt Ben stuck a finger in her mouth, then stuck the same finger in the air, as if feeling the direction of the wind. Hmm, she said. This is a slow brew, I believe. Might need to wait on this one. Tomorrow, I think. We'll see what we see tomorrow. Lovely, said Grandma. Just lovely. Everyone smiled. Grandad squeezed her hand again. She deserved one day back. 
Jojo did not even mind that they'd probably all be in some deadly danger before the day and the wish was done. No one spoke for a moment. There was a little put 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 of gases from Trevor's bottom. Aha! came a sound from the kitchen. Here's the problem. Hop good fellow came waddling into the kitchen, brandishing a round stone. A round stone with a hole through the middle. A stone which Jojo recognized. That's mine, said Jojo. Well then, said the goblin, it seems you broke the washing machine. Jojo took back the hagstone. He placed it together with the nine-sided red gold coin and the white feather in a little leather pouch which had once belonged to his father. He decided to keep the three close by. He was sure that they were important, sure that they were the key for some future adventure. He'd need them. He just knew it. That night, waiting for the wish, Jojo dreamed stranger dreams than ever before. He dreamed of high mountains and deep caves. He dreamed of downing and falling. He dreamed of howling dogs and huge stone giants. He dreamed of himself in the middle of it, running, jumping, climbing, swimming, flying, fighting. He dreamed of acting in all that darkness. He was not afraid. And at that end of his path, two figures loomed, a dark figure with even darker eyes and smoldering flame red hair and a man, Jamie Locke. Jojo's dad. Make him dream. Two figures sat and watched a hill. Today it was an empty hill that Penpero and the Sandman, who had finished his rounds early that night, watched. It was marked by a series of ridges that led to a flat top, ridges that spoke of its past, empty scars on the land that showed what once had stood here. An empty space that whispered of memories lost. This hill that the two elfane watched and once had been a castle. And Maiden Castle had once been a great fort. The greatest in all the land. But this is not why they watched it. Maiden Castle Hill was a memory of an echo of a dream of another world. It echoed from one world to another. Like so many of the great and ancient buildings of the human world, it marked the spot of a greater and more ancient landmark in that other world beyond our own. He must come here soon, said the Sandman. With his eyes, he saw not just the empty hill there in England, but to Din Anher, the citadel on the rock in Elfame. He must come to the House of the Nine. It is now the only way. I wonder, said Penborough, the wizened fairy, her back bent, her eyes weak. If it was always the only way, a night to return to Elfheim, a lock from door to enter the house. The sandman looked from the castle to the old fairy beside him. He seemed to see her anew. He cocked his head and frowned. You will tell him, he said. Penpero nodded. Tell him what you can, while you can. Penpero nodded again, while she could. She was failing now, fading from both worlds as magic fades, as a spell fails. Soon she would be gone. The Sandman nodded. And then, then he will be alone. Soon it will just be him. The man in black weighed his starter's sack in his hand as he spoke. Pinpero pulled her eyes from the moon and back to the man of dreams. Does it need to be, though? Her serious look was gone, and her smile returned. Can you make Jamie Locke dream. The Sandman seemed to think for a moment. Then he nodded. It can be done. But she will know. And it will be costly, he said. She knows, said Penborough. She knows by now that the boy will come. Maybe she is known all along. She saw him in the boat long ago. What she thinks of that, I do not know. She is as broken as magic is. But this, the right dream, might be the extra help Jojo needs. The Sandman nodded. It may be. Neither of the old friends spoke of the cost. They knew what it meant to go there to the house in the other world would cost the Sandman everything. And then after a pause in which it seemed all the universe waited. What would you have Jomi Locke dream? Have him dream of Jojo, of course, said Penpero. And with that, the fairy was gone. She had so little time. The Sandman stayed on. He watched not the hill now, but the castle in that other world. Dreams would come to an end, and all his purpose would be lost. 
he would turn back to cold hard rock and watch the world from above never to return to offer dreams of things unseen to sleeping eyes unless above the castle a storm swirled clouds of black and purple shots of lightning there were crashes above and groans of rock below all was failing i'm coming jamie lock he whispered then the sandman stepped out of our world and was gone young again jojo woke with someone sitting on the end of his bed do you trust me said aunt ben the fairy aunt ben tiny and wrinkled with her parcel and bag slung around her ben pero jojo coughed and then wriggled till he was sitting up in bed it was morning summer light was just breaking between the curtains jojo looked to his bedside clock 806 jojo rubbed his sleepy eyes and yawned i think he began i think i know what's happening and pen nodded encouragingly jojo thought tried to form the words he's coming back at least the memories are all coming back memories said aunt pen yes she nodded again but there is more jojo gulped there is more to be done and i i you need to trust me said aunt pen she had grown so old in just a few days she had been with them she had grown so old her voice croaked it was small like her her eyes were grown weak she squinted at jojo through the thick glasses she now wore jojo frowned you said he whispered i speaking to rico asleep on the camp bed there was a plan you said i thought i hoped i know what you hope it just seems everything seems so jojo's mind went back back to falling through the air back to the badger's tunnels collapsing around them fell the mer boys clawing at him dangerous finished aunt pen but i haven't let you fall yet have i i haven't let you down jojo remembered safe in the tar carried by piskies pulled from the tunnel left in the cave with the stone men coming for him though why did she leave him why did i leave you said aunt pen that's a good question why do you think Jojo thought about this, diving back down the steps into the sea, swimming out, out, out. Because he said, "I need to act. I need to choose. I need to want to, to finish this, whatever this is." Aunt Ben slowly nodded. "You don't need me. You're strong, Jojo Lock. You can act." With that, she hopped off the bed and floated towards the door. With each step, she grew and grew until she was back to being full-sized human, Aunt Ben. The will to act, Jojo Lock, you have it. He didn't need her. Aunt Ben, he whispered, as her hand fell on the door handle. She turned to him with the faintest smile. I do trust you, he said. But said Aunt Ben, rather importantly, you don't need me. What you need, perhaps, is a quiet day. Jojo sat up straighter. He frowned a deep frown. He gave a deep sigh. Then he nodded. He nodded and sniffed. A quiet day sounds good. Aunt Pen smiled. Before the end, Jojo Lock, she said from his bedroom door, "I will tell you a story, the story you have been waiting to hear. When I do, I will have to leave you, for you will know all you need to know. I will have given you all I can. Finally, brave Jojo, you will have to choose." Jojo frowned deeper. Once more he sighed, and this from the very heart of him. Once more he nodded. and then that solemn moment was broken open by a loud shout from the hallway the voice shouting jojo knew well but somehow it sounded different it sounded younger come on jojo shouted grandma up 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 the days hair then into the room bustled a lady much younger than grandma her hair was brown just freckled with gray her face was smoother brighter her eyes shone but it was grandma come jojo look look Look. She was past Jojo and looking out of the bedroom window out to the lane out beyond. Jojo shouted Rico now, bounding out of bed and next to grandma at the window. There is a big tent, Jojo. Jojo stared at his grandmother, amazed at her brown hair and yellow dress. She was so young, but it was grandma. He turned to Aunt Pen to ask if this was her doing, even though he knew it must be. Aunt Pen was gone. No sign of Vera. Come on, the lady at the window said. She must have been ten years younger at least. 
Jojo gulped, then joined them, looking out across the road to the barn and then the field beyond. And as Rico had said, there was a great tent. They watched as Grandad walked up the lane. He stopped when he saw the tent. His mouth dropped open. Trevor jumped and barked around him. Then Grandad turned back to the house. Marnie, he called, rushing back to the cottage. Marnie, you won't believe this. They rushed to meet Grandad by the front door. You won't believe what did, he was beginning to say as he hung up his coat. Then he saw his wife. Again, his mouth dropped open, further this time. Jojo and Rico did not speak. They looked from Grandad to the younger grandma and back again. Trevor did not seem to notice. He walked past her, letting out a little steam of gas as he went. Mar, Mar, Marnie, Grandad said. He dropped his hat and pipe. They simply slipped from his grip. Hello, darling, said the younger grandma. Hello, Grandad replied. You look young, said grandma. I feel young. At least, I remember feeling young. Beautiful, said Grandad. The younger Grandad blushed as the younger grandma too blushed as Rico and Jojo looked on. Thank you, darling, she said. And I do know what day it is. I don't, said Jojo. Are you camping? said Rico. Everyone grinned at Rico. Even Jojo knew that was no tent for camping. There was some big event to take place in there. Come on, said the younger grandma. Everyone needs to get dressed. Put on your vest. What have you brought with you? I'm guessing you don't have suits. Grandma's One Day In fact, the boys found they did have suits waiting for them, let out on their beds, trousers and jackets, shirts and elasticated pink ties, and even a cream waistcoat. And when they met back in the hallway, they found Grandad did too, with a yellow tie to match Grandma's yellow dress. And Jojo found a memory. I've seen this before, he said. I, I remember this. Grandma let out a little laugh. You have, she said. Grandad's brow creased as if he too was remembering, as if memories, hard-fighting memories, were battling out. You were three, he said. And so cute, said Grandma. A naughty little squidgy three-year-old. Was I there, said Rico. Jojo was remembering. He'd held Grandad's hand as they crossed the lane. Now he walked a little behind the other three as they made their way to the tent. Grandad explaining to Rook Rico that if Jojo had been three, then Rico would not have been born. Jojo remembered. They'd come back from the church in Grandad's Jeep. He loved Grandad's Jeep. Mum and Dad had gone ahead in the black shiny car. Mum all in white, Dad in his suit and pink tie, matching Jojo's own. They were waiting in the tent, waiting for the guest. They were waiting in the tent. Jojo looked up past his brother and granddad and grandma. Trevor had trotted ahead and was waiting at the gate to the field. The tent was open, but Jojo could not see nothing within. There was veils of shake pink material hanging in the way. Not yet. Were they waiting for him? Was his dad waiting for him? Rico ran to Trevor and fumbled with the gate. It's a tough gate, that one, said Grandad, and reached out past Rico to unbolt it. Jojo's heart was thumping. Aunt Pen had said she couldn't do it, but maybe, maybe. Jojo couldn't help himself. He ran ahead with Rico, ran to the tent entrances. There were voices within. They pulled at the long lens of fabric that hung in the entrance, and there was no one there. Rico ran on in, but Jojo stood and curbed, trying to calm his heart. Grandad was there now and put a hand on his shoulder. Looks exactly the same, he said. I remember it all, Grandma said, and twirled past them into the marquee. Jojo did too. His dad picked him up and swirled him around. He could remember being held by dad, remembering the smell of him, but not his face. Mum kissed him. Then he ran off, running round the empty tables. None of the guests had arrived yet. The whole tent was his. Rico was doing the same now, running between tables, bumping against chairs. Trevor was running and barking with him. Jojo stood with his granddad and watched Rico run and grandma spin. I don't understand something, he said. Just one thing, 
Grandad chuckled. Okay, there was a lot he didn't understand, but he pressed on. Why did we actually go there into the past for your wish with this? Jojo looked around at the tent and the tables and treasured memories. This isn't the actual real day. Hmm, said Grandad. And why does Marnie get to be young again when I remain an old man? Jojo had not thought of this, but yes, he said. I couldn't say, Jojo, said Grandad. But if I had to guess, I'd say that Aunt Pen or whoever else is behind all this is a downside wiser than you'd credit them. They know not just what we wish for, but we actually need. Look at her. He finished. His eyes fixed on Grandma, who a day before had struggled to fix her own tea, but now laughed and danced, plucking a flower from one of the tables. Jojo nodded. What we need, not what we want. The truth sunk into his heart like an anchor. Look at this, Rico called. There's a book. All three joined Rico at the long table at the very front of the room. And when they got there, Grandma let out a high-pitched scream of delight. Ooh, that's my photo album, she said. I thought, I thought it was gone, all gone. Right at that moment, another scream could be heard three miles away at the station of Door. A train pulled to a halt with the screaming of old brakes. When the train had fully stopped, only one person climbed from the open doors down to the platform. A warm... A woman with long braided hair, a smart black business dress, and a black leather bag that showed just how prepared for anything she was. The woman took a deep breath, inhaling the country air in through her nose, then out in a long stream through her mouth. She nestled her bag back onto her shoulder and took hold of the small staircase on wheels that was sat behind her. Come on then, Lizzie, she said. We are here. Lizzie Log did not like coming to door, for the obvious reason that it was the place where her husband had disappeared. But Lizzie Log kept coming to door, for the obvious reason that it was the only connection she had left to the husband who had disappeared. Vanished, not just from the world, but from her heart and her mind. Lizzie hurried along the platform. Besides, her boys were waiting for her. By some miracle or magic or fairy bewitchment, her boss had called her that morning before work and awarded her an extra few days holiday. No reason given. He didn't seem quite himself, but Lizzie was not going to pass up the chance for time with Jojo and Rico. So here she was. At the end of the platform was a small booth with a sign above it that proudly read Terry's Taxis. Lizzie knew this was a lie. There was only one taxi. There was... Terry, who was a man who sat in the booth, who always seemed to be sitting in the booth, just waiting for Lizzie to arrive. Taxi, madam? Terry called while she was still a long way off. Lizzie smiled and nodded. Of course, good sir, she called, and began the next leg of her journey toward the cottage in the lane. At that moment, Jojo Rico and the grandparents were sitting at the long table, leaning over the big photo album. Look, here you are, said Grandma. The photo in question showed a short, pudgy child. He had a furry fuzz of black hair and wore a tiny suit with the same shade of pink tie that Jojo was wearing right then. Ha ha, look at you, said Rico. In the photo, Jojo was holding a hand. But the person whose hand was being held was out of shot. And that's your dad, said Grandad. Memory. Jojo remembered how it felt, remembered how dad's big rough builder's hand felt in his. Your first course is served, said a gruff voice from low down beside the table. Ooh, Mr. Goodfellow, said grandma as the tiny hobgoblin leaped up on the table with a flourish and presented them all with a miniature plate of jollof rice, colza and plantain. So, how's good old London, said Terry, his eyes fixed on the road, his hands fixed on the steering wheel. Terry Lizinio had once been a taxi driver in London, but had moved to Door as sort of a retirement. It was that sort of place, Door, a sleepy seaside town, at least that's how Lizzie thought of it. You know, said Lizzie from the back of the taxi, her luggage on the seat beside her as they wound along the narrow country lanes. It keeps on keeping on, 
Busy then, said Terry. The thought of it made Lizzie yawn, a big white lioness sort of yawn. I'll take that as a yes, said Terry. Then he said, oh no, and the car began to slow. What's up? said Lizzie, peering over Terry's shoulder and through the windscreen, and there she saw the problem. There was a small hill of grain sitting in the middle of the road, and beyond it, a tractor and trailer. A farmer stood beside the grain, shaking his head. Afternoon, Terry, called the farmer. Bit of a problem, air. I'm gonna kill that boy. Didn't bolt the door of the trailer, did he? Gonna have to stop the combine, aren't we? Disaster. Disaster for you two. No way through, I'm afraid. Lizzie breathed in deep again, in at the nose, out through the mouth. I'll walk, she said, and put a hand purposefully on her luggage. As Lizzie was stepping from the taxi, Rico was finishing his miniature plate of food. More photos, he said, and reached out to turn a page of the album. Who's this? Jojo looked down and breathed in deep. Grandad was silent. Grandma sighed. Who is that? said Rico. The picture was of Grandad and Grandma dancing. She wore the same dress, the same shoes, the same everything as she wore right then, sitting before them. Grandad wore a brown suit, a suit they had never seen before. But Rico's stubby finger was not pointing at his grandparents. He was pointing at a blurred figure in the background. Most of his face was obscured by Grandma's raised arm, but you could see he was tall and broad and the edge of a beaming smile shone out of the photo. Still silence. Jojo got. That's Dad, he said. Ah, said Grandma. Such a wonderful day. Bang. All four logs jumped. The noise had come from outside. Not a scary bang, a magic bang. Fireworks, said Grandad. Remember, there were fireworks. It wasn't a long walk from the spilled grain to the cottage, but it wasn't a long walk for high heels and a uh, business dress. It definitely wasn't a walk for a wheel along suitcase, but Lizzie Locke was attempting it all the same. She had climbed the first tile into the field, hauling her luggage over the fence, and sunk instantly into the soft ground. Her shoes were now stored in her bag, and Lizzie was scrambling barefoot between sheep who crowded the path she was on. I'm coming, boys, she said. I'm coming. And then she saw it, there in the sky above where she was heading. The stars were out. Lizzie looked up and around. The sky was blue, the crowds, perfect, fluffy, puffs, were few and far between. The sun shone down. But above the cottage, night had begun. And what was that? Fireworks? After their surprise at the early nightfall, Jojo Rico, Grandad and Grandma had settled down under blankets to watch the fireworks. Hob Goodfellow had served them roast pork babs with spicy apple sauce. It's just magical, said Grandma. This is exactly how it was. Do you remember, Joey? Do you remember? Jojo remembered it all too. They were the first fireworks he had ever seen. He had watched from his dad's lap. Mum had held his little hand, and he had gasped and whooped and cheered at every sparkle. It had still taken quarter of an hour from when she had seen the night sky to when Lizzie arrived. Sweaty, muddy, and a little chewed by a passing sheep in the lane by the cottage. She took a deep breath, looked up at the final rocket explode, pink and gold, in the sky, and then headed towards the tent and into the magic. Hello, said a voice from the shadows beside the tent. Lizzie peered into the gloom as an old lady appeared, wrinkled and worn, hobbling on a pair of walking sticks. Aunt Pen, is that you? The old lady stopped in front of the candlelit tent entrance. She slowly nodded. You're just in time for dessert, she said. To be continued. <laughs>